and welcome to today's monkey business. This is monkey business for May 24th, 2013. And in today's afternoon coffee newser, we have consumer goods company Procter & Gamble, the company behind some of the most well-known brands of household products in the U.S., such as Downy and Tide laundry products, Gillette razors, Pampers diapers, Bounty paper towels and Duracell batteries, announces that former chief executive officer or CEO Alan George Lafley has rejoined the company as president and CEO effective immediately. Additional background, commentary, and coverage is available via the links in the info box. In IPO news, Channel Advisor Corporation's initial public offering of 5.8 million shares was priced at $14 per share and closed up at $18.69 per share. Channel Advisor provides cloud-based e-commerce solutions for retailers to help them manage sales across several online marketplaces, including Sears, New Egg, Amazon, and eBay. In economics news, the U.S. Department of Commerce reports uh, that orders for manufactured durable goods in April 2013 increased 3.3% to $222.6 billion versus a 5.9% decline in March 2013. Durable goods are defined as goods that don't wear out quickly and which typically have a lifespan of at least three years, versus goods that can be used up fairly quickly, such as dairy products, packaged frozen foods, tobacco products, or paper goods. Cars, furniture, and home appliances are all examples of durable goods. Economists polled by news agency Reuters had expected new orders for durable goods to rise 1.5% in April 2013. For additional details and supplementary reading, links are provided in the info box. Finally, VentureBeat reports that quirky startup Loyal3 has raised $18 million to, as they put it, make buying stock as easy as a Facebook like. Loyal3's concept, if someone loyally buys Apple products or Starbucks coffee, orders regularly from Amazon, spends hours on Facebook and loves to drink Coca-Cola, they might be interested in investing in the companies behind their favorite brands. So the company created a web and social media platform that lets users buy stock at the Loyal3 site or directly through a company's Facebook page in just a few clicks and for as little as 10 US dollars. Fractional share investing isn't new, neither are direct purchase programs. What's a little different here is the awareness of how social media has subtly changed the way companies interact with potential buyers and loyal customers, how consumers scan and swap information, and how brand loyalty can extend to becoming an active shareholder in a company whose products someone just happens to like. New investors can browse Loyal 3's Social Stocks 50, set up not with rows of stock symbols, but by instantly recognizable company logos. And with each step of the process punctuated with that other social media favorite, videos. It's an offbeat but interesting take on consumer engagement in 2013, as the social media spin introduces a few familiar faces to take investors on a window shopping walk down Wall Street. And now over to Marcel for nearly news. Take it away, Marcel. The Kipaltis of Music Crypto Dolls died on May 20th, 2013. That's Ray Manzarek. Show your sister and singer of the Dolls, Jim Morrison, actually died more than 40 years ago in 1971. But the music continues. So today we can have a look at the phenomenon of spikes in posthumous album sales, because that happens. In the case of the Dolls, it was a 1991 biopic, The Dolls, a clip shown above, which introduced the music of the mid-1960s group to new generations of music lovers, with the 15.9 million in album sales since 1991, according to Bloomberg Business Week. Other artists with the most posthumous album sales included Dolls contemporary blues singer Janis Joplin, who died in 1970, John Lennon of 1960s pop group The Beatles, and rock and roll singer Elvis Presley. Several artists whose last albums released posthumously have actually topped album charts, including Janis Joplin with Pearl in 1971, and grunge rocker Kurt Cobain's acoustic set to MTV Unplugged in New York in 1994. Two posthumous releases by country singer Johnny Cash topped music charts in the U.S. according to The Hollywood Reporter, the second one seven years after his death in 2003. Johnny Cash was also the subject of a biopic, Walk the Line, in uh, 2005. If you'd like to read about other artists with notable posthumous album sales, just check the link in the info box. Ah, just to note, you know, these are albums recorded by the artist method. We're talking about contemporary artists here. Because, of course, the majority of recorded music can be considered to be posthumous performance. Oh, let's see, like, uh, compositions by classical composers Ludwig van Beethoven or Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. 
Of course, you know, if you have in your possession an original album of Mozart compositions actually recorded by Mozart, then don't forget to ring me right away because I want to hear that. But otherwise, the artists mentioned are from a central little closer to our own. Several of the names already mentioned also appeared on a list of posthumous number one singles on the UK singles chart, including Elvis Presley and John Lennon. Also making the list were guitarists Jimi Hendrix and Buddy Holly. There's a long and detailed and possibly a bit morbid uh, paper on this which you can read in the info box if you like. But the gist of it is that a sales bump after an artist's death is not really all that uncommon. Two pearl threads from the paper of studying the drama by researchers at the University of Zurich. We studied the correlations between publicity and sales connected to 77 artists who died between 1992 and 2009. Our findings revealed a substantial increase in uh, album sales after death. Elvis Presley, John Lennon, uh, Buddy Holly, Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison were already quite well known before they died. One of the more unusual stories behind one of the number one singles on the list is the story of Eva Cassidy, who died in 1996. A large unknown singer who died of cancer at age 33, she was suddenly famous four years after her death, when a track of Eva singing 1939 ballad over the rainbow was played by producer on BBC Radio 2, and the studio switchboard lit up with colors. In response, a grainy video clip from a live performance of Eva singing over the rainbow filmed at Blues Alley in Washington DC in the US was shown on BBC 2's music show Top of the Pops 2 on December 13, 2000. And a compilation album of the singer's performances, a Songbird, suddenly climbed to the top of UK album charts. Music distributor Blick Street Records notes that by the end of 2001, the album had been certified triple platinum in England for sales of more than 900,000 sold, and gold in the US for sales of more than 500,000 units. If you'd like to see a mini biopic about the singer provided by ABC News, just check the link in the info box. You know, sometimes the curtain comes down a bit earlier, but the music continues. And that's today's monkey business. Take care, folks, and if music be the food of love, play on.